Hello, everyone, and welcome to Uncivil Law, where we learn through the misfortune of others. As always, I hope you will enjoy this live legal education content, and today may be the day I earn your subscription. For today's story, we're going to be talking a little bit about whether or not Kyle Rittenhouse can successfully sue for defamation. For various statements that have been made by various media outlets over the last year and a half or so, in relation to his case. So we're gonna discuss this. This is partially, uh, I suppose, in response to the quartering who posted a video on this topic earlier today. And since he posted on it, I thought I'd post it from a little bit more of a legal angle. So um, as always, I'll try to give you the best analysis I can, no matter what the ultimate outcome is. So the, there's two things we have to bear in mind as we're discussing this. One is burden of proof, and one is the standards as it relates to matters of public concern. So let's deal with that in, in, in order. All right. So as we all know, Kyle Rittenhouse was found not guilty by a jury of the crimes of which he was charged. And charges against him were also dropped, including illegal possession of a firearm and including uh, violation of curfew was dropped. And then, of course, found not guilty of murder, attempted murder, and reckless endangerment charges. So the, the first question you might want to know is, does this have any dispositive impact on a, on a civil case against Kyle or as it relates to Kyle for defamation? The answer to that question is no. It doesn't have dispositive impact. The, re the primary reason, of course, is because one's criminal, one's civil. And the other reason, of course, is because there's no de double jeopardy issues because it's um, because it's criminal or civil, not criminal. But the biggest problem is the different is the different burns of proof. So what do I mean by that? Well, if someone wants to sue Kyle Rittenhouse, for example, for his various deeds that he did on that fateful night in a civil action against Kyle Rittenhouse, they'd only have to prove that he did whatever the tort is by preponderance of the evidence. So it's a much lower standard in civil court than it is in criminal court. Preponderance of the evidence just means more likely than not, 50.1%. You know, just a hair's breadth more than, hair's breadth more than even is preponderance. You know, whichever side has the smallest margin in their favor is preponderance. So if someone wanted to bring an action against Kyle Rittenhouse for what he did, what they would have to prove would only have to be proven beyond, or would have to be proven to preponderance, not beyond a reasonable doubt. Now, exactly what beyond a reasonable doubt means in terms of percentages depends a little bit on what lawyer you, you ask, but normal numbers that are given by lawyers are something like 95% plus. So you'll hear numbers above 95% as to what beyond a reasonable doubt means. But either way, you're talking a pretty, about a pretty sizable gap, right? You're talking about the, at a bare minimum, the difference between 51% and 95%. So you're talking about you know, basically 40, 44, 45% at a bare minimum, you know, almost as much as you need to get there in the first place on a civil action. So the standards are completely different. And this is also the problem if Kyle Rittenhouse wants to sue someone else, um, not only for the acts that were done that night, which also would be to preponderance of the evidence. So if Kyle wants to sue Grouskowitz or Huber or anyone else, he'd only have to prove their liability to, to preponderance of the evidence. So that would be his his standard. But if he wants to sue someone for defamation, right, then you have this preponderance of the evidence problem. He has to prove that defamation was committed against him. But in order to do that, he has to prove it by preponderance of the evidence. So there's quite a large gap there between the two, right? So there's there's quite a lot of potential breathing room for a civil defendant to live in. Because a civil defendant a civil defendant who had to meet beyond a reasonable doubt, which doesn't even make sense, it's not a thing in civil law, but some a civil defendant who had to make that, you know, would have to show, you know, overwhelming. But to win on the civil claim, they only need to show the slightest margin. It's a completely different standard. So the fact that the jury, let me put it to you another way. The fact that the jury found him not guilty does not implicitly mean that it isn't more likely that he didn't, that he didn't do it. Right, because they're totally different standards. So the jury could theoretically believe it's more likely than not he committed the crimes and also believe it's not proof beyond a reasonable doubt. That isn't to say I'm saying what the jury did say. I'm saying what the jury could say, right? So we don't know what the jury thought because they weren't asked the question. We don't know if they thought it was more likely than not or less likely than not because they weren't asked. But they could believe 
they could believe the crimes by Kyle were more likely than not. So they believe that the, the evidence tilted in that direction, but simultaneously believe that they didn't get to be on a reasonable doubt, in which case they have to vote not guilty. But if the jury in its own head believed more likely than not, that's, this, that's the defamation standard. So if they were being asked that civil case under a defamation standard, they would have come to a different conclusion because of the different standard of proof. So hopefully that makes sense about why those why that's different. So the jury verdict about Kyle being not guilty doesn't mean, the not guilty verdict doesn't show that it isn't in fact true, right? The guilty verdict doesn't show that it isn't in fact true. It just shows that they weren't able to prove it beyond a reasonable doubt because you're not asked in a criminal case, did this in fact happen? You're asked, is the evidence sufficient enough to prove beyond a reasonable doubt, right? So you can simultaneously believe something happened for a fact, and it simultaneously can be true for a fact in reality, but you don't meet the criminal standard. And so that's why they're totally different. So the jury finding him not guilty is not really dispositive on any of those questions. The second issue being, uh, being the case is about, um, the second issue being the case is that this is a matter of public concern, public concern. So in defamation law, as I'm sure you've all heard, we have the idea of public figure, which has the elevated standard. Is Kyle Rittenhouse a public figure? Probably not, to be quite honest, but it doesn't matter because there's another, there's another category of thing that's like public figure, and it's called a matter of public concern. So what is this? What is a matter of public concern? Well, the the, the famous case, New York Times versus Solomon, Sullivan, which set out this whole standard about uh, the elevated standard of actual malice, and we'll get to that in a second. So New York Times versus Sullivan has this quote in it. Um, the New York Times says, a profound national commitment to the principle that debate on public issues should be un uninhibited, robust, and wide open, must be protected if freedom of expression are to have breathing space they need to survive. So they, they, at least in that part of the opinion, they aren't talking about public figure at all, right? In that part of the opinion, they're not talking about public figure, they're talking about public issues, which is different. This got a little bit further developed in a case called Thornhill, or apologize, this got further developed in a case called Rosenblum in 1971. Um, so Rosenblum also directly focuses not on the notoriety of the person, but the notoriety of the event. And the Supreme Court wrote, if it is a subject of public or general interest, it cannot suddenly become less so merely because a private individual did not voluntarily choose to become involved. The public's primary interest is in the event. The public focus on the conduct of the participant and the content, effect, and significance of the conduct, not the participant's prior anonymity or notoriety. So it doesn't matter how private a person you are, according to this case, Rosenblum, if you're sufficiently involved in a matter of public concern. And this went on to be a little bit more refined in a case called Snyder versus Phelps, which dealt with uh, emotional distress, but there's a lot of crossover between emotional distress and defamation law. So you can read this as kind of applying to both. And the Supreme Court came up with a two-part test, which is a matter of public concern is if the statement relates to a matter of political, social, or other concern to the community, or the statement relates to a subject of legitimate news interest, that is a subject of general interest and of value and concern to the public. Now that is more broadly written than it is applied, right? So you might think, well, anything of public societal interest, that's like all the things. The language would suggest all the things. The case law that has developed in response to this is not as broad as that. It, 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 is more narrow, it is more narrow than the language might suggest. This is one of the reasons that you need lawyers because they need to know all the case law so that they know what, what, how things have developed. So the, the language has been applied more restrictively than it, than it might suggest. So for example, uh, Nicholas Sandman, which was the uh, which was the uh, Covington Catholic kid with the MAGA hat on in D.C. with uh, the uh, Native American Phelps banging a drum in his head uh, in his face, right? Is Sandman a public person? No. Is it matter of public concern? No, it's not. It's just like it's just an event happened, right? The Sandman's just standing there, a guy's being hand, hand, uh, his drum, you know. 
it might get public attention, it might get public notoriety. But the event is not in that category. It's not of the kind of category of thing where you would expect implicitly the public to be concerned about. You know, the public apparently did become concerned about it, but it's not in that category. It's not of that nature. So that's one of the reasons Sandman is in a different posture than, uh, than Rittenhouse, because he's not a public person, nor is that a matter of public concern, no matter how much media attention is given to it. However, the Rittenhouse issue is a matter of public concern. It's a damn murder trial. <laughs> it's, a, it's a damn murder trial. You know, it, it, that qualifies as a matter of public concern. You know, I don't know, I don't know how much, 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 much more can be a matter of public concern. You know, there was this murder or this killing, I guess, more properly, there was a killing. Two people were killed. A third person was seriously wounded. You know, there was, there was by, bullets being fired. I think that qualifies as a matter of public concern. So I don't think we have to reach too hard to reach the conclusion that Rittenhouse is in a matter of public concern, but not Sandman. So while Sandman was able to sue, and while Sandman was able to get over the, the hurdles, and while Sandman did settle, right, Sandman's legal posture is a fair dip amount different than Rittenhouse, Rittenhouse's posture, because this is undoubtedly a matter of public concern which means we have to go to the elevated standard, right? So what is what is the standard for defamation as a matter of public concern or public figure? It's the same either way. You have to show actual malice. And what does actual malice mean, right? Because it's a defined term. It doesn't have anything to do with hatred to the person. It's a bit of a misnomer. When we say actual malice, what we mean is that you knew it's false or recklessly disregarded the false. The falsity. So one of the ways I put it sometimes is that it's it's malice to truth. It's hatred towards the truth, not the person. Because if you actually know what you're saying is a lie, then you are hating the truth by speaking the lie. And if you recklessly disregard the truth, then you hate the truth. And you're just speaking stuff even though you should like know a, quite a bit better, right? It's not mere negligence, it's reckless, reckless disregard. So you need to show one of these two things. You actually know in fact it's false or you recklessly disregard the falsity. So can you get there for Rittenhouse? And it's not immediately obvious the answer is yes um, for anything. Now, that isn't to say that the answer isn't yes in some specific scenarios with some specific statements. That isn't to say that the answer is universally no. But you, I, at least I'm coming into this with the assumption the answer is no. Right, I'm assuming the answer is no, that Kyle can't win until it's proven to me that he can win because the, the, the factors are against him. They're quite a bit against him. Again, because of different burns of proof. Like you don't, a lot of, you don't know a lot of things are false. First of all, you have to prove their fault, that they know they're false, which, you know, that's very, very difficult because you have to show they actually knew that. And they can believe a lot of things are true, notwithstanding the jury's verdict. Because again, the jury isn't deciding something if it's true or not, they're deciding whether it's proven beyond a reasonable doubt. It's an entirely different standard, right? You can believe something to a 51% certainty without believing it to a 95% certainty. And a 51% certainty is all you need, you know, in order to be on the right side of the defamation line. So like you, to actually know it's false, that's really, really hard. You know, um, especially because most people are basing on secondhand reporting. I mean, if someone who was in the crowd that night, they might know firsthand, but everyone else is basing on secondhand reporting, right? Um, so that's one problem. The other problem is that whether you recklessly disregard the truth. And as to that, you have problems because the, the, the state came out with the indictment or the information as it's called in this case because there's no grand jury, right? And there is also something called fair report privilege, which says if you rely on government documents, you can report on what government documents say without it being defamation. So if it's in a government document and you report on those government documents faithfully, then you can't be sued for relying on the government documents. So to the extent that anyone is repeating merely what is in the information provided by the government, it's it, defamation is impossible. It's impossible because fair report privilege. If you're reporting on that document and you're reporting on it fairly, 
then defamation is impossible because a fair report privilege. To the extent you're not relying on any, uh, uh, and then of course you even have the idea of the trial itself because like all those things that are now being said in court, you know, those were said in the context of an, an official government proceeding. So you, you know, can you can repeat anything anyone said at those trials uh, because they were said in the context of official government proceedings. You know, that's information that's available to the public. So you can rely on that. And I won't go so far as to say defamation is impossible in that case, but it's very, very difficult because you're, I mean, the people are under oath. You know, whether or not you believe them or not is a whole other set of problems. But if someone is saying something under oath, it's it's pretty hard to just implicitly get to recklessness automatically. If someone's saying something under oath, it's a little bit hard to say you're reckless, you know, reckless for believing that. You know, it might not be believable, but recklessness is a whole other set of problems. So. No, anything anyone sent to trial is kind of pretty much fair game. So that covers a lot of ground. Um, and then to the extent you're going beyond that, there's a lot of things that are just opinion. So for example, uh, statements such as white supremacist or racist, uh, the overwhelming majority of courts, and I think all of them, but you know, I can't swear to every court everywhere, but the overwhelming majority of courts have said statements like racist, like white supremacist, are opinion. They're opinion statements. Because what makes someone a white supremacist? What makes someone a racist? Uh, it's a little bit a matter of opinion. You can think someone's racist for any reason. Apparently, in this society, really any reason. So statements like that are non-actionable. They're non-actionable opinion. You, you can only get to statements of fact. You can only get to false statements of fact, not false statements of his opinion. So you'd have to identify, in order for Rittenhouse to win, you'd have to identify a fact, someone said, that is not only not true, because it has to be false. So it has to be false at a minimum, or it's not defamation. True statements can't be defamation in the United States. I understand that some countries allow true statements to be defamation, but not in the United States. So if it's true, you're just done on the defamation. So the first thing you have to do is prove it's false. Second thing you have to do is prove that they knew it was false, good luck with that, or recklessly disregarded the, the falsity of it, which is is difficult. It's difficult. Uh, and and again, my assumption going into this is that Kyle Rittenhouse will not be able to recover. That isn't to say that every lawsuit he brings is gonna be doomed, and if we find one that's particularly good, we'll be sure to cover it. But, you know, the default going in here is it's, it's not going to really work. So that's, you know, that's the, that's the law. That's the law. Uh, it's a matter of public concern. It's the elevated standard. The jury found not guilty, but that's not the standard for saying things that are true. You know, and you can go on a lot less than that. And there's a whole, there's a whole host of problems. So Hopefully that's helpful in some degree to answer some of those questions you might have had about defamation law. Again, this isn't to say that any specific statement that was made will be non-actionable. You might be able to find one, but my default going in, incidentally, I think the ones for the president, for President Joe Biden, are very, very difficult, um, if not impossible. Um, any statement he's made since he's been president would almost certainly be covered by absolute immunity because it would be said within the scope of his job function, which it's pretty hard to imagine something that can't be, that wouldn't be within the scope of his job function, to be quite honest, when it comes to speech. So anything Biden has said since he's become president is almost certainly non-actionable. Uh, Biden almost certainly has absolute immunity. It's a total non-starter. Anything he said that before he became president, well, they're in a much different factual picture then. I mean, at that point, the jury hadn't been, the jury hadn't spoken. They hadn't even been assembled yet. So, you know, him, him making statements or his campaign making statements, you know, in the, in the past, those statements would have to be evaluated based on what was known then, not what's known now. And I find that very, very difficult. So I, I think you're going to have problems getting to, uh, I think you're going to have problems getting to Biden in, in particular. And this would also go incidentally for any other politician, I think. Um, you'd, have a, you'd have a real problem as well. Uh, 
Yeah. Okay, so let's see what the super chats have been in and try to answer some of your questions. On two super chats so far, super chat 999 from Peter Quincy Taggart. Hi, love your show. I'd like to suggest that you discuss the John Gruden lawsuit against the NFL. Look to Adam Carolla podcast with Papa John on 11:15. Skip to 35 minute mark. And Peter gave me five dollars to say about uncivil. Do you know that he killed two black people? I know the exact opposite of those things. I know the exact opposite of those things. And also, like, um, there's also another thing too that you should bear in mind when it comes to defamation law, which is even if you said something that's false, if it's not substantially, if it wouldn't create in the mind. Um, a substantially different impression. So like there's no real material difference between what we call what the defamation is and, and the pleaded truth. So I, I'll give you I'll give you an example um, off the top of my head. Um, let's suppose that you say of a person um, they've been convicted of DUI 23 times and the person sues you for defamation and says, hey, wait a second. It wasn't 23 times. It was only 16 times. Your count is off. You know, those th those other ones, I wasn't found responsible. I've only been convicted 15 times, not 23, right? So you've made a false statement of fact. You've published it. It's factually wrong. But the and it's not a matter of public concern, right? It's just drunk driving, which isn't a matter of public concern. But the thing that's going to kill your lawsuit is that the that what you say is true wouldn't leave a substantially different impression in the person's mind. It's like, okay, what they said was you were convicted of uh, DUI 23 times. So let's imagine the ordinary average person and how they might think of you if you've been convicted of DUI 23 times. All right, now let's 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 imagine that same person, but now they've been now they are told that they think that you've only been convicted of DUI 16 times. How much different are they feeling about you? How how much, how much daylight is there between that in the mind of these two hypothetical people who have been told these two hypothetically different things? One was told 23 and one was told 15. How much daylight is there between that when it comes to your negative impression? Not much, man, not much. So you're gonna have a bad time when uh, the, the court throws you out, be like, yeah, uh, versus the pleaded truth, versus the fact it's only 15, no one cares. That's only 15 versus 23. Uh, everyone thinks you're a scumbag anyway, so it doesn't matter. So you also have to like point to facts that would create a substantially different perception in the person's mind, which is also not eminently obvious for anything for Kyle. So I, you know, not to say that he won't get a settlement, you know, not to say he won't get anything, not to say any of his lawsuits won't be successful. It's just my default going in, my default presumptions are, you know, not not favoring him. Let me answer a few of your questions while I'm have you the 320 of eight, 328 of you here. Uh, if you want to ask a question, to ask a question, just begin your comment with the word question, and I will see it. The bot will pop up, and I'll try to answer some of your questions. Yeah, OJ is a good example. Uh, claiming self-defense, the prosecution has to prove it was a crime and not self-defense. So the burden and meaning of innocence is a bit more proof. Yeah, they have to. Yeah, they have to prove it wasn't self-defense beyond a reasonable doubt. But. No, they have to prove the op. Yeah, they have to prove. Yeah, that's right. They have to prove it wasn't self-defense beyond a reasonable doubt. So you can believe again, it's the same exact example. You can believe it's not self-defense but not be beyond reasonable doubt sure so again same same problem um you know i don't know what this jury was thinking in their head but if they thought if they thought it was more likely than not that it wasn't self-defense that doesn't imply that they would think it's beyond a reasonable doubt because there's such a huge gap right so you know we don't know what was going on in the jury's head but it might be the case it might be the case that they thought that it wasn't self-defense, but they just weren't convinced beyond a reasonable doubt. So it's it's kind of the same problem, to be quite fair. Um, I heard a commentator says opinion that implies a non-public fact. That's true. You can have statements of opinion that imply fact. If you do, those can be actionable. That's absolutely true. Um, 
Ergo says the petition of students to get Kyle off campus based on him being a murderer, can't that be used against who? Depends what you mean by murderer, and a court is unlikely to look at it in its strict technical sense, to be quite honest. You know, if you say, I mean, because again, what is the real difference? What's the real difference between saying Kyle is a, Kyle is a killer, which incidentally is true, What's, how much difference is there between saying Kyle's a killer and Kyle's a murderer, you know, in the average person's mind? You know, there might not be that much difference. So I, I don't, you know, you're unlikely to get a court to slice it that thin for the same reason. You know, if you if you just told, I mean, because you, you have to imagine a hypothetical person and this is what they know, right? This is what you told them because this is the statement that's actionable, theoretically, right? So you told this person, you told this, you tell this person, Um, I'm sorry. So let's imagine, let's imagine a person who's never heard of Kyle Rinhouse. Okay. So that, because what we have to do is this has to be an ordinary, normal person, but we don't have, we can't, we don't necessarily need to assume that they know anything about Kyle Rinhouse. And I'm sure someone somewhere hasn't heard about Kyle Rinhouse. So just imagine you literally told this hypothetical person, Kyle Rinhouse is a killer versus Kyle Rinhouse is a murderer. How much difference is it going to make in that person's mind? Not much. So I don't think there's a lot of daylight between the two things, um, between those two things as well. Um, I am not an alcoholic, and that is just rude. C. Sand says, if I throw a pipe bomb at someone in self-defense with no one else around them, and it's not a booty bee trap, can I claim self-defense? I mean, hypothetically, maybe, but you probably still get in trouble for, for use. You, yeah, you, you, you'll be okay on the self-defense claim, but you're gonna have other problems. Um, so yeah, if you, make, if you make a pipe bomb and you throw it at someone in self-defense, then you might win on the self-defense claim. You know what you're not gonna win on? The making a pipe bomb because it's illegal to make a pipe bomb. Also, under federal law, it technically qualifies as a weapon of mass destruction if they want to prosecute you that way. So you might win on the self-defense claim, but you're going to have problems somewhere else. Will I be covering the straw man purchase? It looks like it's legal within the state law. So I, I don't know if that case is going to go anywhere, to be honest. Uh, I'm not aware of any specific statements. Elidian says, I'm not aware of any specific statements that Kyle might have a best chance for. Does his mom have a chance? His mom has a better chance, for sure. She is not She is not a public person. This And, and as to her, it's not a matter of public concern, would be, my, would be my initial judgment. So if you can show specific statements, and there you only have to prove negligence because you don't have the heightened standard. So, you know, if people were saying, for example, he, she drove his son across state lines, you know, and that has been rebutted, including by the prosecutor, incidentally. So it would depend on when they said it, it depend on when they said it and what knowledge was available at that time. But his mom has, his mom has better chances because she's not a public person. And as to her, I don't think it's a matter of public concern. You'd have a, you'd have a hard time squeezing it into that one. Um, and on a scale of one to Carpenter, how much table is the prosecutor of the Potter trial doing? Quite a lot, man. It's, 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 it's great. It's, it's, it's annoying. It's, it's just very, very annoying. Yeah. So those are all the questions you have so far. So is there anything else? Is there anything else to discuss before I hang up? I mean, yeah, there might be there might be specific things. His mom has better chances. Uh, his chances are not great going in. And even if like you drove your son across state lines, you drove him there, there'd be an issue of damages. Like how much how much damage is there in that perception? So how much does it damage her? So I you know there's there's issues to be had there. Look at Insta. Okay, let me look at Insta. Insta.
Insta doesn't have anything. Um... Oh, getting me the comments that I missed now? Okay, so Stephanie's going to give me some comments that I missed so I can react to those as well. That'd be cool. Question, does the college issue weigh in it at all? Yes, quite possibly, but we need to know specifically what statements are, and we cover that to some degree. Um, it's, it's a problem. Uh, not interested, said. So how is race legally defined and attributed? How can someone legally prove the race they belong to? Good question, man. Good question. Um, the short answer is it's not really legally defined. Uh, it's kind of defined in its absence, but not defined by like a sufficient threshold. So I'll give you an example. We covered on the channel one time a guy who was applying for minority business loans because he said he was Native American or black or maybe both. So there's there's certain loans that are available from from governments. These could be federal, state, city, whatever. There are certain loans that are available for certain women. There are certain things that are available for certain minority populations. And he tried to claim that he was black slash Native American or maybe both of them. And it turned out from the genetic information that his amount was like exceptionally low. I think it was like under 3% for either of them. And so the court said that isn't what they had in mind. So they, they said 3% wasn't enough, but beyond that, they didn't really speak to it. Uh, yeah, we, we, we covered the uh, self-defense. Yeah, in the self-defense prosecution has to prove it was a crime and not self-defense. So the burden and meaning of innocence is a bit more unclear. Yeah, so in the case of proving, in the case of proving that it wasn't self-defense, it could not be self-defense and they just weren't able to prove it. So the, again, the jury could believe with 51% confidence that it wasn't self-defense, but not believe it to be on a reasonable doubt. So you don't know if the jury thought to the civil standard. Uh, Auger says, any chance you start in OnlyFans with Stephanie? Stephanie, that's something you and I will have to talk about at another time. Uh, Kath, 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 Caitlin, Kathleen Weiss says, what about white supremacy BS statements? Yeah, the white, the, as I was discussing earlier in the stream, the, the overwhelming vast majority of courts that have discussed it, um, and I think maybe all courts that have discussed it, although I can't swear to every decision, but the overwhelming vast majority of courts that have discussed it have said that statements like white supremacist and racist are opinion, not fact. Uh, Jay says, any updates on lady that talks to peanut butter? I think we did film a... Did we film an update recently or did we have problems? But I forget. Uh, Elidian says, question, are those loan programs illegal based on discriminating against protected classes? No, uh, particularly when they're offered by the federal government because the federal government is the one that defined the protected classes. So they can define around it, right? They can have, you can have statutes that are in conflict with each other. Or they do it all the time or statutes that make exceptions to each other. And um, at least under the law as it currently exists, no, even where there's city or state that are making it available to minorities, it's affirmative action. And affirmative action is currently legal. So, you know. Not interested in sense. When you say race is a construct, that means a fictional man like fancy, like religion. I never said race is a construct. I don't think. I, I didn't say race is a construct. I just construct. I just said that race doesn't have a firm defi definition in law except by its absence. So I, I'm not taking a position on whether it's a construct or not. Uh, Unbiased says, does that mean that anything factual isn't supremacist in nature? Um, it means that anything factual as to whether it is supremacist in nature is a matter of opinion, not a made matter of fact. So you could have facts that are 
supremacist, but that's an opinion. Uh, so I, I, yeah, I, I don't, I don't think so. Uh, question, Kyle got banned from his EA video game client for using his real name, unless he sues them. Is there anything to that elsewhere since a large company has his name labeled violence? Well, not really. I mean, not for the least of reasons that Kyle what, what, did something violent. I mean, that's factually true. I mean, he did it for good reasons. Uh, what about when TYT trashed his mom and called her a horrible mother for driving across state lines with a weapon? That's after the trial. Then that sounds promising for Kyle's mom. That sounds promising for Kyle's mom. She has a false statement of fact, fact that was disproven. Um, you are likely to be able to get to, well, you don't have to get to reckless disregard for her. You only have to get to negligence, which is much easier. So yeah, Kyle's mom seems like she might have, if you ask me going in on first blush, so yeah, Kyle's mom might be able to get to TYT for that statement. That sounds more promising. Uh, Kathleen Weiss said, why did Simon Man win against CNN? I explained this more at the beginning of the stream. It's because, um, it's because the, the standards are different for Sandman and Rittenhouse. Um, Sandman is not a matter... Sand, neither Sandman nor Kyle are public persons. In order to be a public person, you have to purposefully inject yourself into the public space. So you can't be forced into the public space as a public person. And neither one is a public person. So Sandman and Rittenhouse are identical in not being a public person. What seems to strongly distinguish them is that Rittenhouse is a matter of public concern where Sandman is not. You know, it might have become a matter of public concern because the media basically decided to force it into being a public concern, but you can't force it into being a matter of public concern either, right? In the same way you can't force a person into public status, you can't for force an issue into public status. It's like either public or it's not as part of its essence, right? So there's nothing, there's no real public concern about a fact that a guy stood there with a bag of hat on with a smirk on his face and, you know, some other guy was beating a drum, you know, three, you know, basically next to him, you know? So there's, it's not a matter of public concern. So that, that lowers the standard substantially to Sandman. What makes this different for Rittenhouse is that Rittenhouse, this is a matter of public concern. A murder trial, murder trial definitely qualifies as a matter of public concern. I don't think there's much doubt about that. Um, Christopher Baker says, I sit for the bar next July. What did your regime regiment look like? Okay, I can talk about this. Now, first thing I did that's not available anymore is I did a course called Micromash, which is now owned by Barbary and I don't think it's offered anymore. But I had I had a I had a strong dislike of uh, Barbary. Plus they're expensive, but you know Barbary is an option. But I'll tell you what I did. So um, I converted a bunch of I think it was PMBR. PMBR does a lot of multi-state stuff. Um, I converted a lot of PMBR CDs to MP3, and I would play them on my iPod because this is back when iPods were you know a thing. I uh, <laughs> Uh, I, I would play them on my iPod and go to the gym. So every morning I went to the gym for about two hours or so, and I listened to um, the PMBR MP3s, you know, just basically pressed random and whatever play that they played that day. Um, then I would um, every day go to a coffee shop, and it was always the same one. It was it was a particular caribou coffee. Um, it was a particular, well, sometimes I get lunch on the way. Sometimes I'd eat, I'd eat there, but usually it was just fast food. But I'd go to Caribou Coffee after lunch or for lunch, and then I'd do multi-state problems. So again, it was like, it was PMBR in the book form. It was flashcards. It was that kind of thing. And then I'd do that for about three hours or three and a half hours or something. And then I'd go home for dinner and then when I did dinner, I was doing micromass, which again was more multi-state questions or it was essay questions. And I did that same routine every day for about three months. So, and I actually have a really good story about that too, in, in terms of perseverance on this. I have, I have a pretty good story about that. So, um, I had scheduled it. I had scheduled it so I would have, I would take all the multi-state questions from 
uh, micro mash before I sat for the bar. And I, as memory serves, there's like 2,460 questions of multi-state questions. So over three months, I had to do 2,400 questions in this computer program, in addition to other stuff I was doing. And um, it was either the day before the exam, it might've been the day before the exam. It was either the day before the exam or two days before the exam. Um, where I got a question in my multi-state and I got it 100% wrong. Um, and every time I get the answer wrong, of course, I looked it up in the back of the book, right? Because I want to know the right answer. So this dealt with something called entrustment under the UCC. Um, entrustment under the UCC is where you give a, a purveyor of that good uh, possession of the good and they accidentally sell it or purposefully sell it. Right, so you're not giving it to them for the purpose of selling it to them. You're giving it to them for the purpose of whatever. But if you give, if you give, if you, so when you give something to anybody, it's called entrustment. But there's a specific rule as it deals with purveyors of that good. So if you give, um, if you give an item to a purveyor who is the purveyor of those goods, and they, you know, transfer it to somebody else, they can give good title. They can, they can legally, well, they can't strictly speaking legally sell it, but they can legally give title. Because one of the things you might want to sue for is what's called replevin, which is basically give me the thing back, right? Give me the thing back, that's my thing. And so this rule says you can't do that. It says you can't sue for replevin, you can't sue for the thing back. You might be able to sue for money damages, but you can't get the thing back. Um, and that is not the rule on common law. In common law, you have the idea of bail or bailee, and you have this idea of bailments, which is different than bails for bail for a uh, like criminal bail. Uh, bail in a civil term just means uh, someone who's basically in possession of a thing. Um, and you might, if you ever go into a parking garage, if you ever go into a parking garage and they give you a ticket, look at the ticket, and probably on there somewhere is somewhere it says this does not create a bailment. That's one of the reasons it says that, by the way, because this is a legal concept, but anyways. So like a day before the exam or two days before the exam, I got this question on entrustment under the UCC and I didn't know it. I didn't know it. I, I mean, I guess I never saw it before. I never popped up in any question I ever had before. Um, and so I didn't know what the answer was. So I just answered under common law. And the answer, uh, the answer under common law is, well, you get the thing back. And then I, you know, it tells me I'm wrong and I go to the back of the book and it, or the computer program tells me I'm wrong and it flips me up the answer and it tells me, you know, under the UCC, under this rule, there's a rule that says, you know, this thing about entrustment. If you give it to a purveyor of goods, blah, 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 you know, you can't get, good, they can give good title even if they didn't have good title. They can, they can convey something they didn't have. They can convey something they didn't have. They can convey good title even though they didn't have good title. There's a special rule for it, right? And I was like, oh, okay, that's real interesting. So fast forward, fast forward like the next day or two days later, I'm sitting in Virginia, I'm sitting in Richmond in Virginia in some, you know, room somewhere. It's it's not fancy. And they give you essay questions, right? They give you, I, I forget if it was six, five or six essay questions. So it's probably six. They give you like six, six essay questions. And I don't remember, I don't remember most of the questions, but I remember, I remember that question because I got an entire essay question that was completely based on entrustment. The question, the question was just entrustment through and through. And uh, that made me very, very happy because I was like, you know, two days ago, I didn't know the answer to this question. And uh, now I do know the answer to the question. I'm gonna get this question 100% right. I just studied it. And also I'm fairly confident, I'm feeling fairly confident no one else in the room is gonna get it, right? I was like, no one else is going to get the answer. So, you know, as I'm sort of walking out of the bar exam um, at the end of the day, I'm, I'm asking people just, you know, as I pass by, hey, what did you get on that, uh, that question dealing with the guitar in the pawn shop? And everyone I said, everyone I asked, they said, oh, and it specifically said, by the way, it specifically said in the call of the question, discuss this under the UCC. So it wasn't ambiguous. It specifically said, discuss this under the UCC. So when I was asking people later, I was like, oh, what did you write? I was like, oh, I talked about Baylor Bailey. I talked about Baylor Bailey. Eh, wrong answer. So I was feeling very, very cocky and self-assured on that one because I'm, you know, because I was studying every single day and studying right up until the last minute, 
I learned a thing that was the basis of an entire essay question. And you never you never forget that one, man. That's that's good stuff. Um, it's a it's a good story. Uh, Ten dollars from Frosty Snowman. Has anyone really been fair, even as decided to use, even want to go to do more like? Four ninety nine from Johnny Faze. Thoughts on Toyota forcing owners to pay subscription fees to use their key fob? That's that's pretty fucked up. In some cases, I've heard about that. I just heard the headline. In some cases, retroactive to model year twenty eighteen. Five dollars from Kim Carr. Have you considered teaching at a local college? You seem like a natural. Well, the thing I want to teach is law, and so you know, no local college teaches law. So you know, all all that good stuff. So. But if there's a law school out there that wants to hire me, I'd be fine. Uh, can all the appearances he made on different media be used against his claims of harm from defamation? Yes, of course. Anything Kyle's ever said can be used against him in a claim. Of course he can. Sasquatch says, I appreciate UK law Unliable is very different from U.S. law. Yeah. I find it bizarre that news reporters can blatantly make a BS about a person without challenge. Well, we have a First Amendment and we take it seriously, perhaps too much so sometimes, but yeah. Would the age affect Kyle and Sandman as they were minors at the time? No. Hypothetically, if Kyle were never charged and media made similar statements, do you think it still qualifies as a matter of public concern? Yes, I think so. Uh, I think so, for the same reason that the Brianna Taylor death is a matter of public concern, even though the officers weren't charged. I mean, someone has died. I think the fact that the police shot somebody is a matter of public concern. Now, I personally think that the shoot was justified, and we've discussed why, but they never charged those cops. I don't think them charging or failure to charge is what's gonna gonna trigger that. Not interested, said maybe you could start something new, a new way to study law. Hey, what do you think this channel is trying to do every day, man? We're trying to start a new way of starting law. How do we establish the value of damages suffered in Rittenhouse from similar cases? Well, it's ultimately a jury question, but yeah, you would get experts to testify as to harms that might incur in his lifetime and stuff like that. So there's ways to value it. I mean, this is kind of the same way you value anything, you know? You get various experts to testify as to what damages there are and try to get them to present evaluation on all the rest of it. Internet comments here says legally justified or morally justified. I don't understand the question. Um, in any case, I've been on long for enough. I do appreciate the 320. <coughs> um, Ledian says random question. Do you have a background? Do you just have a background in law? I'm an engineer and consider pursuing education for patent law. Do you think it's a good career? Well, in order to do patent law, you have to have an undergrad in a technical subject. Um, you can't practice patent law without a technical undergrad. You, in order to be a patent lawyer, you must have a technical undergrad. And there are some, there are some exceptions that, you know, but basically the equivalent and, you know, a technical undergrad is, is the thing that's by and, war, by and far going to be the thing that gets you in. Um, in my case, it's computer science is my undergrad degree. I have an undergrad in computer science. Um, so, uh, yeah, if you want to do patent law, then uh, do I think it's a good career? Depends a lot what you're looking for. Um, it can pay very well. Um... So there's that. In any case, I'm going to sign off. Context of the Brianna Taylor cops. Do I think legally innocent or morally innocent? Well, legally innocent for sure. Morally innocent? Well, the only thing that they arguably did that was immoral was not knocking and announcing. I mean, even the boyfriend said that they knocked but didn't announce. So is that an immoral action? I don't think so. 
Frosty Stamp Snowman says, please make more videos discussing concepts like GPS. Yeah, no problem. We can talk. We can talk more about time dilation. Talk more about uh, general relativity, and uh, you know, shoot, shooting shooting light from a spaceship that's going the speed of light and stuff like that. Uh, Easy proxies, ergo proxy says, could there be an argument that Kyle benefited from the defamation? Got invited to Crowder because of it in a way. That might be a mitigation on damages. So possibly. Yes, I think so. Yeah, we, we have to we have to discuss, you know, we have to discuss uh we have to figure out what more things to discuss that are also interesting scientifically. Chemistry is my chemistry is my weak subject, by the way. Um, so if you ask a chemistry question, my answer is just no. Um, if you want chemistry, talk to somebody else. Um, physics is the thing I'm strongest in. And then after that, it's probably biology and way, 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 way in last place is chemistry. I, I failed chemistry in high school and, uh, that's because it completely did not click on any level. Uh, I, I didn't get it. And I still don't get it. And so chemistry was not for me. So talk to somebody else on the chemistry thing. So yeah. Susan says, I think you make a great teacher. You make law understandable to someone like me. Yeah, I, I'm, I appreciate that. Um, what is time dilation? Time dilation is, is relativity. We discussed that. The fact that time itself changes uh, based on speed or based on gravity. So... Um, if you have a clock, the clock isn't always, well, from its own frame of reference, it's always ticking at the same rate, but it won't be ticking at the same rate relative to other clocks that aren't moving. So if you put a clock, if you have a clock on earth and you have a clock in a satellite that's moving around the earth because it's moving, so it's moving fast, the clocks are internally ticking at their own, the same rate, but they're measuring different things because time itself is now slowing down. Time slows. It, it Time actually moves slower um, the faster and faster you get to the speed of light to the point where if you could move the speed of light, it would be instantaneous and time stops um, at the speed of light. So time dilation is the concept that as you move faster and faster or you're under more and more gravity, that... Uh, space-time itself becomes warped and time starts ticking at different rates. That's time dilation. Favorite movie and why is it Interstellar? My favorite movie is Thank You for Smoking because it's a kick-ass movie, man. Chemistry is just applied physics. I've heard that before, right? So you find the, you find the purity chart, like there was an XKCD cartoon about that. Yeah, chemistry is just applied physics. And, uh, you know, or bio, you know, uh, biology is just applied chemistry. Chemistry is just applied physics. And, and then over on the far end of the chart, physics is just applied math. Uh, so yeah, it, you get to the, the, to the more and more purity of, uh, the scientific, uh, spectrum as you, uh, get closer and closer to just mathematics. Um, Ergo says, I really like honesty in all these cases you cover, but how do you stay positive after reading all this? Um, it depends on the date, man. Some days I'm positive, some days I'm not, to be quite honest. Uh, I'm going to hang up now, and I'm going to try to call Stephanie. So I hope all you have a good night. Um, if you haven't seen this already before, or you've ha if you ha haven't liked, give it a like. If you haven't subscribed, give it a subscribe. Thanks to all the new members. I think we're at 45.8 last time I checked. What is the exact count? on the channel. Let me just check real fast. The exact count is... Oh, 45.9. We actually made it. We, we crossed 45.9. As of right this second, it is 45,901 is the number of subscribers. So, hey, that's really good. Um, uh, 50,000 by the end of the month, maybe, with a little bit of luck. That'd be awesome. I'm going to sign off for now, and um, I'm going to... Um, you know, do some more stuff. I'll post something out of it. Equilibrium is the best movie. <sighs> Equilibrium is okay. It's, it's Equilibrium. 
I mean, it's got it's got good it's got good gun fu, so there's that. But uh, it's a little cliche. Uh, I'm gonna sign off for now. I hope all is well. Cheers and good night.